My teachers and guidance counselors in high school told me, explained to me, screamed at me, you're never going to learn anything being obsessed with all those horror movies. I would argue that I've learned plenty, and 1977's The Sentinel would be my doctoral thesis on I Live My Life by What I've Learned from 1970's Satanic Horror Movies. Hey guys, this is Sam from BNS About Movies. You're listening to the podcast, BNS About Movies, based on the site, BNS About Movies. Amazing how that worked out. Anyways, let's learn some lessons. Lesson one, all models live dissolute lives. Allison Parker is our heroine in this film. She's a busy New York model. She's gorgeous, and she is bad crazy, suffering strange psychosomatic issues such as night terrors, insomnia, and random flashbacks all the time she tried to kill herself. After she moves into a spiffy Brooklyn brownstone, she wants to see if she can live on her own and not with her rich boyfriend Michael, Chris Sarandon. But right away, she starts hearing random noises and meeting people who may or may not exist. That'll lead to work-related trauma, and she often passes out while modeling and ends up in the hospital. A young pre and in order, Jerry Orbach, is having none of her shenanigans, asking if they can just move her and give her clothes to another model. She also hated her dad, who just died. Her first suicide attempt came as a teenager after she walked in on her father playing with an entire room full of sex workers. And it turned out that her boyfriend is being investigated by the police, played by Eli Wallach and a super young Christopher Walken, for killing his wife. Needless to say, she's gorgeous, but she doesn't have issues. She has subscriptions. Lesson 2. Catholic priests have crazy secrets that will destroy your secular mind. Only one person supposedly lives in the building with Allison, and that's Father Halloran, and he's John Carradine, a priest so blind that his eyes look like Emily from the beyond. All he does is sit in front of his window and stare out into the endless void. Turns out that Allison's new home is really owned by a secret society of excommunicated Catholic priests. I mean, all the cool ones are, right? And they guard the guard, guard the gateway to hell. And that gateway, yeah, it's right here in the building. And Father Halloran is the sentinel, the blind guardian of the abyss. Why is Alice in there? Well, they've chosen her. Because of her last two suicide attempts, she is the perfect candidate. And the only way to get to heaven is by becoming the next sentinel for her. Because Halloran is ready to die. Lesson three. If you were in a satanic 70s horror movie, do not trust anyone that was an old Hollywood star. Amy's neighbors start off nice, but they're all demented, like the two leotard-wearing we- ladies who offer in for tea, then begin to do some kind of weird exercise video while she just tries to drink said tea. This scene may be for shock or titillation, but it's one of the unsexiest, most hilarious take-your-mind-out-of-the-movie moments you've seen, and keep in mind Beverly D'Angelo of National Impunification is one of them, the other is Sylvia Miles from Midnight Cowboy. But it's that old Hollywood royalty in the building she needs to watch out for, like Ruth Gordon and Ralph Bellamy and Rosemary's Baby, Burgess Meredith's Charles Chasen starts nice, but it turns out he leads the minions of hell. At least he has a cool cat, right? That cat gets a birthday party that Allison runs screaming from, finally telling her real estate agent that the people in this building are driving her insane. Again, it turns out no one lives there, no one else but old Hollywood folks, ready, willing, and able to be behind the cause of Satan. And the real estate lady is Ava Gardner, so you know whose side she's on. It was Jose Ferrer, wandering around in a red robe, if you recognize someone that was in a movie in the 1940s in this and they want to give you some Tannis root, just say no. Also, Martin Balsam's in this. It's Professor Rosinski. Lesson four, and hopefully you never run into this, but if you are the hero or heroine of the 70s satanic horror movie, you're f- Lesson five, never trust Chris Saranda, not even in the slightest way. Michael tries to help Allison discovering the big secret to this film. He breaks into a church office. And he learns that the moment the people with suicide attempts disappear, they show up as priests assigned to this building. What you don't find out is that, spoiler warning here, Michael dies off camera and becomes a demon. One of the demons trying to convince Allison to kill herself so that hell can come to our world because there is no sentinel. There's only one person ready to be the sentinel, and it's her. And she has to stop being a model. This seems like a lot to ask, but if you went to Catholic school, this is when they would pull you aside for four hours and explain to you how Jesus died on the cross. If you're aware of Chris Sarandon's movie history, you shouldn't be surprised that he's the bad guy. Jerry Dandridge from Fright Night, a vampire who literally screws with Charlie Brewster to his face in front of his mom before killing and stealing his best friend and then having sex with his girlfriend. And if that wasn't bad enough, he's Prince Humperdinck from The Princess Bride. He spends an entire movie two-facing the princess. Anytime I see Chris Sarandon in a movie, I've seen him in person. I am will not even come near him. I do not trust him. I don't care if he's the voice of Jack Skellington. If you are a character in a 70s satanic shock fest or really any movie with Chris Sarandon, I implore you, please do not trust him. Lesson six, avoid Michael Winter at all costs. I'm joking. I love Michael Winter. Uh, 
Death Wish. Come on. I even love Wonton Ton, the dog who saved Hollywood. I mean, it has a million aging Hollywood star cameos. So there's a good chance one of them is satanic, right? Anyway, Michael Winter quarter controversy. And he was more known as a restaurant critic and England's rudest man at the end of his life. But here, he courted controversy by making an artistic choice. Instead of costume demon, he hired real deformed people to wander around. It's pretty unsettling. It's kind of awesome, but also very strange to see a crazed Burgess Meredith commanding an army of tumor-faced, genetically challenged real folks to help a girl kill herself. That said, Christina Raines felt that Winter was the real horror of this movie. She claims she was in tears every day on the way to the set and refuses to watch this movie because it stirs up bad memories. So if you follow the above rules, I think you'll survive being in this movie. That said, the 70s really were a horrible time to be alive. So there's a really real chance that Satan will turn your happy ending into a twist downer. We'll have to reflect on it. Oh, yeah. And I also love this movie because I grew up Catholic and I would read the Pittsburgh Catholic each week to see which movies were given the dreaded O rating, which condemned them for being morally offensive. Other movies given the O rating are Pink Flamingos, Dawn of the Dead, Barbarella, Billy Jack, The Wicker Man, Amityville 2. I mean, so many movies to check out. I really need to do a letterbox of movies condemned by the Pittsburgh Catholic. Here's some extra credit. The Sentinel was written by Jeffrey Kovitz, who gifted the world with a team romp Gorp and produced the sequels to Bloodsport and Cyborg. Speaking of sequels, sequels, has <laughs> sequels with cyborgs in them. Speaking of sequels, he wrote one to this movie called The Guardian. The alternate title was The Apocalypse. And I'm just going to share the description with you. She was the Sentinel, the living guardian of the gates of hell. She was the sole barrier between humanity and the forces of Satan and evil pent up since the fall from grace. Hers was the most terrible penance of all, chosen for her sins. She had been committed to a living death, a blind nightmare in which the only reality was the reality of her demonic adversary and the awful power she had been endowed with to constrain him. Now her penance is nearly up. For Monsignor Francino, that means the resumption of the most dreadful task the church has ever bestowed. Once again, he and he alone must find and commit a new victim for the guardianship, knowing that every step the powers of evil will battle to pervert the changeover. To the Prince of Darkness, it means a final chance to unleash his minions on the world and begin at last his long way to reign of evil. For mankind, it means the apocalypse. This movie needs to be made. Extra credit part two. If you're looking for a film that hired Dick Smith just so we could push the R rating to the gory of limits, this is a great choice. This movie feels like an Italian movie. Abused dads get their noses shredded. An eyeball gets decimated. Blood explodes out of heads. It's a shame he didn't create the actual demons in the movie. I think he went off in other directions. And really, Michael Winter is not shy for showing gore in a movie extra credit three you can spot jeff goldblum tom berenger and richard dreyfus all in this but blink and you'll miss them and finally some extra credit for uh michael winter one of my favorite people to talk about almost died from eating poison oysters and his estate was questioned upon his death when it was discovered he was paying for numerous ex-lovers i wish someone would make a movie about his life also he also died from eating another point he got diverticulitis for a while because he thought that he could live only eating steak tartare. I think 11 days into it is when he got sick. Uh, if you haven't had steak tartare, it is not cooked. Oh man, Michael Winter, you're the best. Anyway, if you want to be the Sentinel at the Guardian of Hell with me and uh, at the Gates of Hell, that's a Fulci movie, you just come to my website, bnsaboutmovies.com, or you can reach out to me at b and s about movies at gmail.com thanks for listening and uh, watch more weird movies